Um, I don't know how many of you know what cockroach is. Probably some of you. Maybe a show of hands might be useful. Yeah, so a few. Uh, so I, I didn't hear the question. <laughs> I'm sure you all know what a, a cockroach insect is. You live in New York City. Um, <laughs> we're, we're definitely a New York City based company, so the name makes a lot of sense from that perspective. Um, I, I'll have a short overview of what the database is, but I don't want to go into too much about like um, what it is. And um, since this is an engineering audience, I'd like to talk a little bit about um, how we do what we do and um, why that's different from the other things that are out there in the ecosystem. So, just in case you're wondering, we did call it cockroach because one of its chief characteristics is that it's supposed to be very hard to kill. And um, you know what it is, this is just a, the shortest slide here, um, it's a scale-out SQL database. And um, it's a survivable one, very hard to kill, and, and crucially it's consistent. So it, it's transactional, of course. It's also strongly consistent across wide areas, which is how it gets its survivability characteristics. And the last point on here is, you know, almost as important as the others, it's deployable, and it's deployable with what I think people are starting to consider the, the new way of doing things in the, in the, um, for the future, which is you know, in containers, um, in the public cloud infrastructure. So an overview of the architecture here, and it's quite simplified, but uh, these are the pieces I'm going to talk about in the, in, this, uh, in the rest of the slides here. So we implement everything as a set of layered abstractions, and this is crucial because the system is pretty complex. And the, the layers allow us to treat um, from the higher level things below us as black boxes that provide functionality. And at the lower levels, we can just ignore everything above us. So this, this is pretty important, and we try not to break those abstractions. So I have SQL up here as the top, um, and it's on top of this transactional key value layer. Um, SQL is really just the starting point, and the transactional key value um, layer is really going to give us a, a base upon which we can build other kinds of database personas. So I have SQL, and also you could do a graph database if you wanted to. It's a relational or graph. You could even do a document store if that's what you wanted to do. So it's really just the starting point, and we see other things down the road, but um, right now we're a SQL database primarily. So there's a, another layer in here which we'll talk about, which is what I'm calling a monolithic sorted map. And it's what's sort of logically underneath the transactional key value store. Um, this is where the data in the, in the database is distributed out to the various nodes, however big your cluster is. And finally, underneath there, um, we do replication. We break up that big monolithic sorted map into little smaller key ranges um, that are contiguous. And then those smaller ranges are what are replicated. We use Raft, which is a consensus algorithm to do that. And Raft is what's responsible for writing each one of the replicas to the lower level physical storage. So SQL. Um, I think it's a pretty good question to ask why we're going for a relational SQL database. You know, especially given the last 10 years, people got really enthused about NoSQL and just like how it's going to solve all the problems. And um, actually, it turns out that NoSQL is in some ways kind of hitting a brick wall. I mean, there's still plenty of use cases for it. But uh, relational databases and SQL in particular um, evolved over about the last four decades. And they're really, really good for building applications. Um, there's a lot of tools for them. There's a ton of ORMs for them. So we're definitely leveraging that. And there's a lot of people with knowledge of SQL, how it works, how to use it properly. Um, I think one of the things that people, when they think about SQL that they don't like is schemas. And schemas are a pain in the neck because you've got to think about your stuff beforehand, right? And then they're also really dangerous. When you get them in production and you need to change something, uh, that can be you know, a fraught enterprise, to put it mildly. But they're actually not evil, right? Um, I think that that time that you have to spend organizing your thoughts beforehand, organizing, normalizing your data, that actually pays off in the long run as things become more and more complex. When you, when you start just throwing everything into your document store and you know, it's just got all this unstructured data in there, um, you, you end up with a mess and it becomes very difficult to build on that and to iterate. Um, it turns out also that the reason that many people think SQL, our schemas in particular, are very dangerous is because MySQL had some, had some implementation issues. So there's no reason that schemas have to you know, lock your database when you have to add an index. That's, that's not a function of schemas. That's a function of MySQL. Um, and so we're, we're going to avoid those missteps. And also, SQL is actually good for more than just building applications. Um, it's really great with its declarative syntax um, for actually doing data analytics. So there's, there's a sort of a one-two punch there. I just think it's going to be important. 
So what's different about our SQL implementation? Well, primarily, because everyone, I think, when they think of SQL, they're used to sort of single node instances, unless you're using Oracle Rack or something, but that's not most of us. Um, we're scale out. And you know, very importantly, this isn't, you can scale out a SQL database, as I'm sure people in this room have done by sharding it, right? That's the common thing that you see everywhere. Crucially, what we want to do is scale out such that you are not aware of shards. There's no application level knowledge that you're doing any of this, this scaling. And that's, and, and that's incredibly important. Um, we, you know, we'll talk about how some of that's done in some of the f uh, further slides. We also provide some modern features. Um, this, is, this is interesting. When you actually scale out SQL, you really want to organize your data differently than you would if you did a single node. In particular, what you want to do is create hierarchical tables. So you, you know, if uh, you have a customer and a customer has orders and orders have descriptions or you know, other little bits and pieces, um, what you want to do is actually for a particular customer store everything together. It means that you know, typically when you're updating something in a cu customer, you're updating more than just one thing, and having those all go to the same proximate location in a distributed database means you're touching less nodes. So that's very important. So these modern features, they include things like um, an ability to uh, organize those tables hierarchically and also get result sets back from the database um, that include the hierarchical information. Um, we also provide um, a new sort of modern dialect. Um, it, we, Postgres is what we're based on, but we have some um, new functionality that lets you do the kinds of, for example, like triple quoting and uh, escaping of characters that you're used to in a language like Go. Um, but uh, you know, if you actually look at the SQL standard, it's some pretty messy, antiquated stuff. So there's a way to change that and make it a little friendlier. And finally, this online schema changes part, um, this is how we are not locking your database when you need to add an index. And so there's no locking. There's no interruption of service. If you add an index, it kind of goes through these uh, a couple different phases. And this is a technology that Google actually published about, and they provided it for their F1 layer on top of Spanner. It's uh, pretty amazing. They came up with proofs for how this all works, but essentially you go through some phases where this, the uh, index is not readable if you're adding it, but it's being backfilled during that point in time. It can be modified, but you can never read from it. You can't use it. After the backfilling's done, it flip, flips sort of into the next stage, which makes it both readable and writable. And at that point, you can start to use the schema. So it's, it's, it's actually, a, and there's kind of a similar but backwards um, progression if you're removing a schema, or sorry, an index, um, or a constraint from a column. Um, adding columns and things like that is like actually um, extremely trivial, unless, of course, you're adding a column that has uh, certain kinds of constraints. But all of them uh, will not lock your database, which is, I think, the really crucial part. So a little bit more about this transactional key value store. Um, we actually weren't going to originally for our beta target SQL um, because SQL is pretty hard to do. We actually ended up hiring enough qualified engineers that we uh, were able to move the goalposts of our beta forward and say we, we actually want SQL. Um, we were originally going to do a transactional key value store. And the reason we thought that was a, a good enough place is that it's a really like a, this foundational building block. It turns out that no matter what kind of database you have at the, at the highest level, whether it's graph database or a relational database, all of the operations that you do at that level can be decomposed into a sequence of key value puts or conditional puts. And, um, and if you make those, if you make it so that that key value store that uh, you're, you, you know, storing that sequence of operations to is transactional, you can pretty much build anything on top of it. We didn't want to end there because the problem is that if you just have a transactional key value store, while you can build anything, you essentially have to build something. <laughs> you, no one wants to just stick around with the key value store unless you have a very simple use case. And typically that simple use case becomes a non-simple use case, a couple iterations of your use case. So you know, the first thing that I've done anytime I've had a, a key value store is, is the you know, sort of root level storage device was have to build an index myself. And uh, I'm sure some of you have done that with um, key value stores. And you build the index and if you don't have transactions, it's not consistent and it starts to leak garbage and it becomes a pain in the neck. Um, so, you know, we actually think that the right way to do it, as we mentioned before, is SQL. So we're really happy to make that uh, the level that we're providing. But um, even if we were only going to have SQL, as opposed to potentially leaving the road open to do other kinds of database personas on top, we would still build a transaction, transactional key value store as, a, as an intermediate level here. And that's sort of you know, the, about managing the complexity. The thing I was talking about with these layers of abstraction. Turns out that if you wanted to really build a you know, distributed relational database and you didn't build this you know, sort of decomposed key value step in the middle, it would not be a tractable problem. 
so you know what's different about what we're building? Well, I think um, the, the key part here, there's a, there's a lot of you know uh, distributed key value stores out there. Essentially, Cassandra is one, React is one, um, HBase is one, based on Google's Big Table. Um, you know these things, what they lack is transactions, and in particular, like fully distributed transactions. So that's what we're providing. And uh, you know it's important to note that these things are not just bolted on to the top of uh, a, a distributed key value store. They really they really have to, in order to make them efficient, they have to go through um, a lot of the layers of abstraction. So it's it's the one part that consistently sort of penetrates. It goes all the way down to the MVCC layer, which is at uh, sort of underneath raft at the very low storage layer. And uh, you know, to just build it as a, a, a transactions as a layer on top would be very inefficient. Something that Google did on top of Bigtable, something called Megastore, and uh, the transactional performance there is pretty poor. So we actually, you know, in the interest of making application programming easier, we don't give you like this huge set of SQL ANSI isolation standards like repeatable read, you know, read committed, all that stuff. We actually are serializable by default, which is the highest level of isolation. Um, our serializable implementation is very performant um, if you have low contention. If you have very high contention, then it could be problematic. So we also offer snapshot isolation. Um, there's a very small difference between the two. Serializable will give you um, will give you no write anomalies, at least none that anyone's um, come up with with the various serializable. Um, implementations that are out there, whereas snapshot isolation, there are some very nuanced ways to get inconsistencies if you have concurrent transactions. Um, but just to give you a data point there in terms of how safe it is to use snapshot isolation, Oracle, and I believe this is still true with Oracle, if you set a transaction to serializable in Oracle, it actually gives you snapshot isolation. So you know, you'd think that Oracle would have done it right. Well, you know, snapshot isolation is good enough that it looks pretty much like serializable. So we actually implement our distributed transactions without using locks. So there's not a strict locking phase, which makes it considerably more efficient. We're doing a lot less writes in the process. Um, but it's essentially optimistic in the end, which means that you expect transactions to restart. So if you do locking, you know, what happens is if you know, someone's already using a resource that you need as part of your transaction, you're going to wait. Um, with this, essentially, it's kind of a race to see who can abort someone else, which means that you restart more. But you can't get away from the potential for your transaction to be aborted, even even with locking because you have to deal with the possibility of deadlocks, which the database needs to discover and abort one of the two transactions that's involved. So I talked a little bit about this monolithic map. What this really is is a sorted set of key values that, um, you know, if you think about it, it's called monolithic. It's just one gigantic set of keys with their associated values, and it's sorted. And this is important. Um, if you're thinking about what's the difference between Cockroach and something like Cassandra or Cockroach and React, it's that um, those those systems use what's called a consistent hashing mechanism in order to look at the key value, hash it in some way, and then that actually tells them exactly where the data is located in, in the larger cluster, which makes look up's very fast, but the problem is that you can't have um, easily sorted data structures, which are pretty important, especially for something like SQL indexes. It would be extremely difficult to build a SQL database or relational database, I should say, on top of something like a consistent hashing scheme. Um, you can also do feeds and queues and things like that, much easier to handle. Um, you know, a monolithic map also saves you on repartitioning costs. If you have a particular hashing scheme and you want to add a lot of capacity to your cluster, typically what you need to do is, re is move things around um, in, in a way that uh, sort of rebalances things. Um, when you're doing rebalances on a monolithic map, you're very unconstrained in how you do it. It doesn't matter what the key values are or anything like that. All you're doing is taking a chunk of data and moving it somewhere that's more convenient in order to get better balance. And also on recovery, um, with typically with a consistent hashing scheme, the, the various values um, for one shard are duplicated in another shard. With uh, something like a monolithic sorted map, um, the way that Cockroach is doing it, you're actually able to use the aggregate bandwidth of the cluster to recover any particular node that has uh, uh, failed. So the way that this uh, actually is done, the way that we distribute um, a mo this monolithic key range is that we break it up into segments of contiguous key space. And we call these things ranges. And what they are is about 32 to 64 megabytes of data. Um, and uh, those are essentially the, the unit that's moved around. We keep them that small because it means you can do very fine-grained rebalancing work, very fine-grained uh, recovery. And uh, so you, know, you, you don't kind of get locked up on moving one thing or doing one thing 
it's just these, these rel relatively small pieces. Um, what that means is that each one of those ranges, which can be, of course, replicated across, you know, say any three nodes or any five nodes in the, in the larger cluster, um, have to be locatable, they have to be addressable. So the way that we do this, and it's actually the same way that Bigtable does it, I assume the way, same way that HBase does it, um, and it's the same way Spanner does it, is we use something called a, it's a bi-level index. So all of the nodes in the system, all the gateways that are taking, that have to essentially do addressing, they're aware of the, the very first range, which contains the zero level indexing data. You look up in there to find the first level indexing data, which is, can potentially be on uh, quite a, quite a um, any, any, essentially, as many ranges as can be addressed by that zero range can contain the second level of indexing information. And then that whole set of ranges can contain all of the information for where to go find the data. So it turns out that bi-level index, the reason we don't just do one level, is that would only give us, you know, depending on how large your keys are, uh, you know, somewhere in the range of tens or even maybe a hundred uh, terabytes of data, which is really not enough for a scale-out database. Um, with a bi-level index, you could theoretically, and again, it depends on key, range, uh, key sizes and so forth, but, you know, something like four exabytes of data. And if you need to get bigger, you could make it a tri-level index, or you could make it so that the ranges are bigger. There's lots of ways to play with it. But um, the bi-level really does give you a lot of latitude for how big you want things to get. And finally, we actually offer um, a concept that we call replication zones. And this essentially allows you to take any part of your monolithic map, any sort of key prefix or range, and, and specify what the replication factor is. Should it be 1x if you don't really care that you know, your data is survivable? Should it be 3x or 5x? And further, you can specify that each of, uh, each of the three replicas has a certain location or certain kinds of uh, nodes that it needs to live on. So Raft. Raft is a consensus algorithm. It's a variant of something called Paxos. Um, it's actually very recent in the uh, it's, made, it's, it's a recent entrant, um, and it's a very popular one. It actually made its debut in 2014, and uh, it probably has, um, I think, an order of magnitude more implementations than Paxos has at this point. Um, it was actually introduced because it's a simpler to understand consensus algorithm. Um, what these consensus algorithms do is they essentially say that we can replicate your data in a way that is, is going to be, um, you're gonna create, all the replicas will be exactly the same, um, given some, uh, some constraints, but you know, if you have three, you can always make forward progress with the majority, so two have to agree in order to, to, to handle a right. And what this allows you to do is have one failure out of three and, and continue to make forward progress. It also allows you to get an exact answer back. That's the strong consistency part. Um, without strong consistency, you can make a right and then go to read, like even a millisecond later, and you know, due to some sort of failover or something like that, you can end up actually not reading the value you just wrote, which really complicates writing applications. So we actually share etcd's implementation of Raft. This has been quite a boon for us. A lot less work, and um, you know you have fewer bugs with more eyeballs. Basically, they've done a good job. They're on their um, this is their second full refactoring of it, and it's it's quite it's quite well written. So I mentioned this strong versus eventual consistency, and I think this is a big difference between Cockroach and you know the other scale out NoSQL databases out there. Um, you know, a lot of those are operating on eventual consistency as a default. Some of them are providing strong consistency now as options for doing reads and so forth. Um, but you know, the default, I think, is what really matters when you're building applications. And uh, eventual consistency is something that I think seems okay at first, but becomes very problematic in the long run. Um, you know, there's, there's kind of, I think, this decision point where you know, clearly if you're a financial institution and you, you write a value as part of a transaction, then you go to read it, you don't read the value you just wrote, some bad shit can happen, right? It's uh, potentially like catastrophic, in fact. If you're just talk, counting how many likes are on a Facebook page, you know, you, can, you could argue that's not a big deal and that you know, reading stale data is not an issue. There's a huge gray area in between. And the problem is you start off as a developer knowing and understanding your use case, such that you're like, well, if we fail over and the data is not exactly fresh because it didn't manage to make it through some asynchronous replication pathway, we can survive. We can build on top of that stale data. It's not going to you know, break the system. Um, the problem is you, know, you leave and other engineers come on and the business use case iterates and new features get added and you start to lose track of how, uh, what, what those guarantees actually should be and how dangerous it will be if, if they aren't met. 
So wrapped also allows us to do this wide area replication, and this is this is how Cockroach gets its survivability. So wrapped is wrapped is the piece that is replicating information across geographic regions, and you really have an opportunity. I mentioned these replication zones before to specify exactly how much survivability there is. You can have more replicas, which obviously gives you more survivability, and you can also spread the replicas out further. If you put the replicas all in a single data center and the data center goes away, you know, well, you've lost your, your database. Obviously, if a machine goes away and you have the three replicas in a single data center, you can still make forward progress. That's great, right? But like, you know, even if you say, we're going to put the three replicas in three different availability zones in the East Coast region of AWS, that lets you lose an entire data center, which happens with AWS. Um, but if the whole East Coast loses power, as it did a few years ago, then your database is gone again. So actually, what Google does for their whole AdWords system, which is what's making them their you know, billions of dollars a quarter, is they, they spread uh, their data across five data centers across the continental United States. So it's essentially any kind of write requires three of those to agree on the write to make it committed. And that means that they're getting higher latency, and that's the cost that you're paying to get this guarantee. But uh, you know, as much as that cost is, which could be like 50 or 60 milliseconds for a write to go in, they're willing to pay that on AdWords. And actually, it turns out they're willing to pay that on almost all of their applications. They're really moving. Um, there's a huge push now to move everything on this spanner. So they're, they're, you have to do things to, and be aware of that latency. But the end result is your applications are very straightforward. You get to imagine that your database never goes away. So multi-raft is, is, is also something we've built. It's something that's on top of raft. And it's what handles the fact that, you know, I mentioned before, we break things down into ranges for the larger key space. I mean, a big system is going to have millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of ranges. Each one of those ranges is replicated to multiple nodes. So a node may have hundreds of thousands, a million ranges even that it's, it's, it's dealing with. Each one of those has its own raft group. So there's a lot of raft stuff going. It's like spaghetti between all the nodes. And multi-raft is what kind of handles that and demuxes it and muxes it. So finally, this is really you know, future direction stuff, but we absolutely don't believe that a database in 2015 should look like a database did in 2000, right? You have these SQL standards and you think that that's you know, kind of where things should, should start and end, but that is like, that's very wrong-headed thinking. You know, this first item here, full text indexes, geospatial indexes, you know, a lot of people these days, you, you kind of expect that when you're writing an application. And, and it doesn't, in my opinion, make sense to have to offload your data through some you know, Kafka message bus to some system like you know Elasticsearch is indexing it or Elasticsearch is reading things and you have to query that but it's eventually consistent. I mean it, the database itself should be able to handle these things. This isn't rocket science. Um, it, it can be implemented and it can be part of a scale out database. Um, another one that we that we see all the time is this real time data analytics and um, there's actually another sort of associated part. It's essentially this idea that you know, and it makes sense when you're talking about the old school OLTP databases that you had to scale vertically and you just didn't have that much capacity and you just couldn't, you couldn't mess with the latencies on those, those OLTP transactions or the amount of throughput you could get. So you just had to offload your churn, all of the data that's being thrown off into a separate system. And then that separate system, well, you're talking about an ETL that moves it, your schemas get out of date, it's a lot of updating, a lot of work. You're maintaining a separate system, which let's say is a scale out Cassandra system or something like that or some data warehouse. And then, you know, you're running your OLAP stuff and your analytics on that but you can't use the stuff that you would use if you were using SQL because now you're using MapReduce or using something else. And then those, those insights make it fed back into, the, you know, into a management console or even back into your product, depending. Um, that's a lot of moving parts, right? You know, with something like a scale-out SQL database, you actually have the ability to make that stuff synchronous. Um, you, you can do it in real time. You don't have to have the ETLs between things. It's a, it's a, I think there's a potential to really consolidate. And finally, this last one is something I get asked about all the time now from companies, which is, People are really worried about the safe harbor provisions that are, you know, really, you know, coming into the fore now. And the, the question I get is always, I'm going to have customers from all over the, the world, and I need to make sure that these customers' data that are in Germany or in France or in the EU stay there, and they can't go. The, the data has to be resident there. And uh, you know, is there some way that you can do it? And our answer so far is, well, yeah, actually, Cockroach is more set up to do it than almost anything else because you can actually set up, um, you know, these zones essentially and have a German data center zone, an EU zone, a France zone, a US zone, and uh, you know, essentially uh, make sure that 
that you you have a replica of your schema in each one of those zones and it's essentially you know it's nice because you can still do distributed transactions between those various databases but you know I think the right way to go is to really make this integral and transparent in the product so you can do like row level data residency and that's quite possible so that's you know I think another direction that we're moving on and I think this list will go on but I think the important point is um, you know you have a lot more latitude in terms of IOPS with a with a scale out database and you can build much better products Cool. Thanks, guys. So, uh, start a question. I understand there's uh, Donald Trump inspired hats. <laughs> there is. So, we, we uh, Donald Trump had this funny hat that we tweeted about, which was like, make America great again. And so, we, uh, we photoshopped him, and he had a hat that said, make databases great again. So, uh, we actually have some of them if anyone wants one. And Jessica has them there. <laughs> Get your own Donald Trump hat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hey, um, so you mentioned something about uh, Kafka message queues and how your broker is dealing with uh, conventional consistency. So are you suggesting that Cockroach PDU replaces that infrastructure? Well, I'm suggesting that it could, right? I mean, if you, if you have uh, the kind of, if you have a scale-out database and, you know, you, you could make it so that you're using just the same resources, maybe a little bit more for the replication that you were previously using, um, you know, with a really scaled-up system. So, you know, the same cost, but you have more instances, so forth, right? But what's to stop you from saying, okay, we're actually going to take that, we're going to increase it by three or four times that much. And so now we're spreading like the actual load in terms of how much you know throughput we need to handle, transactions per second, whatever, into a, to much more machines. And so these things aren't really being used as much. And each one has replicas of the data. All of a sudden you have you have you have headspace, right? Or, or like headroom, I guess is the right word. Where now you can actually do other kinds of things, right? For example, you can store other kinds of data. There was a use case while some of us were working at Square where you know, they actually had items information for all of their merchants, and that items information was constantly churning because merchants were changing their prices and things. But they needed to be able to get historical receipts that looked like the way that the items looked, you know, down to the description and everything historically, and that needed to be repeatable. So they built a whole system which was, okay, well, all of that, all of those changes into the main OLTP store go through, you know, a message bus, and then they get written into a Cassandra system. And then around that, let's build a... Um, a system essentially that has an API and uh, you know accesses that information to generate the receipts. Um, you know queries Cassandra and you know in a, obviously a very different way than the data is really you know written into the primary store and uh, you know reconstitutes the receipt and then sends it out. You know that's a, that's a lot of engineering work and it's, you know it's a fairly big team and it's been going on for three years. Um, you know I, I think I'm not saying that you can replace all of that work. Of course you can't, right? You still have to build the receipt stuff into there, but. I do think that you can eliminate a lot of it. So, but wouldn't, wouldn't in that, like in the scenario where you have some IoT device that's, you know, let's say you have a thousand of them streaming 30, uh, streaming a single data point 30 times a second, uh, concurrently into your infrastructure, you have the Kafka, uh, they have the front end API that's load balanced to another load balanced Kafka message queue that is then against the load balanced uh, database. Uh, you know, typically it would be a, shard, a set of shards that are managing that, that throughput, but you're saying that Cockroach replaces just the database layer or replaces the message queue and the database layer? I mean, I'd have, to, I'd have to look a little bit more carefully at exactly what those pieces are, are providing for you, like how much buffering and, and whether that's necessary, um, you know, in terms, but, you know, ultimately, yeah, you can, you can create as many cockroach nodes that are going to be, you know, and, and hash whatever the incoming data is so that it will spread out amongst them, um, you know, kind of arbitrarily. If you can do it, if you can do it with a sharded RDBMS of any sort, you can do it with cockroach. If you can do it with, uh, you know, any NoSQL sort, you can do it with cockroach just fine. And, um, um, and, and you know, because of these zones, you're actually able to, um, if you need to, completely isolate the costs of that in terms of you know, you know how it's affecting the, um, you know, let's let's call it just the resources on that physical machine. Because you can say that you know everything that's that needs to be, you know, uh, OLAP processed or everything that needs to that's coming in that's just being dumped like time series or whatever it is that you that you're that's coming in from say your your IoT devices, um, that stuff can be in 
can be writing to tables that are in a zone that puts its replicas on machines. Let's call it, like, let's say that these things can be spinny disks because we're really just, you know, we're just, the nice thing about uh, cockroaches, we're using RocksDB at the lower level, which is a log structured merge system, which means that, you know, it's just doing huge sequential writes and they're very, they're very inexpensive compared to like a B tree type thing. So, you know, you can, you can absolutely, you know, create a, a, a cockroach table that could handle that kind of incoming um, data. And I think, you know, the great thing about getting it into a single cluster, even if you, if you, you know, create tables that have different replication zones and so forth, is you have all of these guarantees still at your, your fingertips. Like if you really do, and I'm not saying that the IoT data would need this, but if you do need to um, do, you know, distributed transactions and things between your, your, whatever your data sets are, that's, that's you know, um, just kind of part and parcel. And I'm also not saying that you should use Cockroach to eliminate all of like the various you know, um, systems that are part of whatever your architecture needs to be. Just that there are certain ones that seem to be ripe for consolidation. Right. Well, I mean, there's a lot of services that are trying to be an all-in-one where you can write to the HTTP from any device and then they want you to just have that as your backup. Yeah, I mean, like, there's. I, I would say that there's there's real value to that, right? There's there's just a huge operational cost to having um, lots of different components that are connected with, you know, essentially unreliable um, channels, and um, you know, obviously, like one thing that I, I've just seen again and again is divergence of schemas, you know, and, and the cost that that has because you know certain people are just uh, you know really uncommitted to keeping up to date, and it just becomes more and more of a technical debt. And so, uh, I think consolidation can uh, help mitigate that. Spencer, thank you very much. Yeah, of course.